Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2023, the summer of Trek, all summer long. Vin at Revenant Reads and a group of other booktubers, including myself, have been reading Star Trek fiction. It's been great fun. I love Star Trek fiction. I have from the very beginning. Uh, I've been mixing it up all summer long between things that I've never read before, didn't know anything about, and things that I've read many times. Sometimes with a happy middle ground, like today, where it's the, uh, I read it and promptly forgot about it, filed away and forgot about it. Once upon a time, there was a flood of Star Trek fiction coming out into bookstores every month. And I did my best to keep up with a lot of it, especially the original series, which is my Star Trek. I tried my best to keep up with all of it. So I'd pop these things down, and I would only really pause and sit back and think or comment or write to somebody if the book was outstanding. I wouldn't otherwise. If it was average, I wouldn't, I would just, I'd read it, I'd pop it down, I got my Star Trek fixed for that month, and then I'd move on. And I think this was one of those books, and it doesn't seem like it would be, because it's by a really talented writing pair. Judith and Garfield Reese Stevens are, do a lot of really good Star Trek fiction. I read one of their books last night, a reread, technically. I think this probably came out in the 90s. This is called Memory Prime, uh, with this weird cover where Spock doesn't appear to know that somebody is behind him, the guy with the weird fingernails, and he has his shirt torn. And doesn't seem to care about that either. A very weird, dorky cover for this thing. And the book itself is a, kind of a quasi, a conceptual sequel to an original series episode that nobody would put in their top ten, The Lights of Zetar. Uh, in the, the Lights of Zetar, Scotty gets a love interest. One of two love interests that he gets in the course of the original series. Neither one of his love interests turn out very well. <laughs> in, in this case, that The Lights of Zetar also introduces us to uh, the concept that the Federation has uh, basically storage farms. They basically have computer hubs for gigantic amounts of data. That doesn't make any sense. It might have made sense at the time, and, and maybe science fiction writers, I forget who wrote The Lights of Zetar, I should probably know that. Uh, but maybe the writers of the time thought, well, given that our computers are getting more and more sophisticated, right? There was a room-sized computer at the time when the Lights of Zetar came out. There was a room-sized computer in California that had up to one gig of memory. <laughs> uh, people maybe thought, given the way our technology is going, surely it will reach a point where our storage will be so great, our storage needs will be so great, that we will need a central repository. If we have libraries for printed books, surely we will have the equivalent of a gigantically sophisticated library for electronic data. It's not actually how things work. I don't think I don't think the idea makes any sense. I might have thought maybe I thought it made sense when I watched the lights of Zetar, but I it wasn't long after that. It certainly wasn't long into the computer era where I thought, well that's a little bit antiquated as an idea. Uh, this just follows up on that, just weighs in on that completely. The Enterprise is taking a group of uh, scientists and specialists, very illustrious passengers, to Memory Prime for an award ceremony, the, the Nobel and Z. Magni Prizes that Kirk mentions in the original series there. And they get there, and th there's a murder. And this becomes, much like yesterday, much like the Vulcan Academy murders, this becomes a murder mystery, among other things, but mainly that, it becomes a murder mystery. There are all sorts of strangers at, at Memory Prime. There are also semi-sentient uh, android-type beings that are the custodians of Memory Prime. Precursors of data, in a way, uh, the being data, not the thing data, I would assume, they are fleshed out fairly well here. In fact, everything is fleshed out fairly well here. Uh, Judith and Gar do a great job with characters, with dialogue. Their, their ear for original series characters is flawless, so that you, you really do feel that this is an adventure that our characters are having. This also has the added benefit, if you want to call it that. I know some of you don't think it's a benefit. To me, this has the added benefit of being easily picturable as an original series TV episode. Easily. You could easily film this, uh, even on the, what we now think of as the shoestring budget of the original series. That would be that would be simple and satisfying. There's a five act status here that is satisfying, and the, the the reservation that you hear in my voice is because something was off. I don't quite know what it was. 
I definitely reacted to it the first time I read this 50 years ago because it was not one of those books where I felt the urge to write about it and to write long letters to, to fellow Star Trek fans and post them right away and then eagerly wait for the response in the mail or anything like that. It wasn't, wasn't anything, didn't have that effect on me the first time I read it. And this time, a little more critical because, of course, all those years of Star Trek have gone by. And I have read and watched other standout Star Trek and lots and lots of average Star Trek. And somehow this is average. And even now, reading it the second time, I really can't put my finger on what it was. Except, maybe, that it was the same thing that was wrong with the Vulcan Academy murders. Which is not that our characters are out of character. Much. In the Vulcan Academy murders, there are a couple of characters who are badly out of character sometimes. But in this book, none at all. Everybody's perfectly in character. Maybe it's not that, so much as it is that the author of this book, the authors in this case are familiar with science fiction, they're familiar with Star Trek pastiche fiction, but they are taking on the task in this book of writing a murder mystery, which is not science fiction. It has its own rules, its own expertises. If you're not good at it, you won't be good at it in your first try just because you say you are. I know this from bitter first-hand experience. I have tried and, in my opinion, failed a few times to try to write a classic murder mystery, even a disposable one. There's a lot more work that goes into plotting a murder mystery than it seems on the surface. Uh, and the murder mystery element here is just as disappointing as the Vulcan Academy murders. The, 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 per, the, the guilty party is completely obvious from the very beginning of the book. The minute you know all the characters, barring any last-minute entries, and you're going to get a couple of those, you're also going to get a lot of great exposition here on subjects that are surprising. Aspects of the, uh, the classic Trek mythos that you wouldn't expect are fleshed out rather well in this book. Rather intriguingly, I don't think they're canon, uh, but they're, it's, the exposition parts of this book are very interesting to read, far more interesting than the exposition parts of the Vulcan Academy murders, but that only goes so far. If you are, if you are boiling things down to the actual elements of a classic murder mystery, and you don't do a classic murder mystery well, your book is going to fail. And I won't say that this thing fails, but now, with the benefit of hindsight and the second reading, I can definitely put my finger on that being the thing that disappointed me about it, is that it's not what it, 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 it's not what it purports to be. It's not good at what it boils its own plot down to being. That's why I left, uh, I left it thinking, well, okay, those are those great concepts, and a couple of great lines. Kirk and Spock have some great interchanges in this book, uh, in particular. But... The dissatisfying thing is that it wasn't a good murder mystery. So, uh, uh, so I'm afraid I'm, I'm limping to an end with Book Trek here. I'm going to try to get a slam bang read thing done for, uh, for tonight because I don't want to end Book Trek on a blah note. <laughs> that would be, that would be pretty bad. I think considering how much I've loved the event, who knows? I will, tonight I will dip my toe into a few different Star Trek books that I've not read before. See if any one of them gives me that kind of electric tingle that, oh, this is really good. This is going to be really good. I will either do that or I will finish Book Trek on a strong note by rereading a, a Trek book I know I like. I, I could go either way tonight. I'm going to try the random approach. Not quite so random because I'm going to sample a whole bunch of things. But I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to visit strange new worlds <laughs> while, while engaging in book track instead of just covering the same ground that I've loved for all these years. We will see. I will give my final captain's log tomorrow. <laughs> we will see what we find. So I'll wrap this up for now. I will see you then. Thank you, book two.